Welcome everyone. We're here today for President's Day or President's Day or President's Day. It depends on where you put that apostrophe and where those S's go. This is a lighter look at our nation's history and we are really happy to have local historian Ken Cool with us. He'll share interesting facts and sometimes forgotten tales uh, about the presidential office, George Washington. Was he really the nation's first president? Do we know? Um, who led the nation between the end of the Revolutionary War and Washington's inauguration? Who was doing that? Do, do we know? Ken's going to tell us. Um, and what happened to the former national holidays that celebrated Washington's birthday, Lincoln's birthday? Um, where did those go? How did they get reconfigured? So it's going to be a fun um, 60 minutes we have going forward here. Um, and it's going to be super fun because the gentleman who's taking the time to gather this information and share it with us today is a Granby resident and a local historian. Ken Cool writes feature articles about local, state, and national history for the Granby Living Magazine. And Ken also serves as a trustee for the Friends of Cossett Library. And Ken is on the Granby Economic Development Commission and serves on the Agro-Tourism Committee. So without further ado, let's get the show on the road and let's welcome Ken to, to Granby Community. And thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you, Holly. I'm looking forward to this. I've never done this before. <laughs> so welcome everybody. Um, I've been writing, um, I, I never really took any English in school. So all of my writing experience has been something I've learned as an adult. Um, but when people ask me to do something, I usually say yes. So um, um, almost 10 years ago now, the uh, Granby drummer, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Granby Patch uh, online newspaper started in Granby and they were looking for someone to write history articles. So I agreed to do that. Uh, about three or four years ago, the Granby Living Magazine um, came out in Granby and they were looking for someone to do a history article. So I agreed to do that. Recently, after joining the Friends of the Cossett Library Board, um, they are looking for articles for the Granby Drummer. So I agreed to write articles for that. And uh, some people think, I guess, that I just have all this knowledge of history. And really, I don't because I'm not even from here. I'm from Minnesota. But um, history today is so readily available online. You can uh, look up facts. And so this process for me is as much about learning history as it is about sharing it. So um, in February, every year, I have to come up with something that was going on in Granby in February. And uh, holidays um, are one of those things that are always interesting. And so I put together a little presentation. I'm going to share the screen right now. <clears throat> so in my um, research for this um, month's magazine for Granby Living, I started looking into President's Day and uh, I noticed that it was spelled different um, in different places. If you Google it, you see all these different spellings. And so, and I've wondered since I was a boy, uh, what are we really celebrating? Uh, are we celebrating one President's Day, multiple President's Day, all the presidents, which one is it? So, um, we, <clears throat> excuse me a second here. I grew up in the 50s, started uh, elementary school in 1957. And back in those days, February was a big month, not just because it, we had Valentine's Day, which we got to give Valentine's to everybody in our class. It was the shortest month of the year, however, but it encompassed two holidays which we got off Lincoln's birthday on February 12th and Washington's birthday on February 22nd. Two school-free days for the kids, two days off of working for working parents. But there were also terrific bargains on bedding, linen, and towels at the department store white sales. What was not to like about February? 
Nowadays, though, many of us, whether we're employees or students, don't get any weekdays off at all in February. We're offered a single holiday that falls on the third Monday in February, and it's neither Lincoln's nor Washington's birthday, but some hybrid known as President's Day. What happened to our traditional February holidays? Just what the heck are we commemorating on President's Day? Some of us think we're observing George Washington's birthday, which is perpetually moved to a more convenient Monday, the third Monday since 1971. Some of us think we're celebrating the combined birthdays of <clears throat> George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, two formerly separate holidays smushed into one. Some of us think we're honoring the memory of all presidents, past and present. Well, which is it? Interestingly, <clears throat> President's Day can be um, printed in three different ways. Plural, possessive plural, and singular plural. And that's the three different spellings that we see. <clears throat> Excuse me. According to the Chicago Manual of Style, they use presidents with the apostrophe, which is a singular plural, I'm sorry, a plural possessive um, as the official, <clears throat> excuse me, spelling. So saying President's Day implies that the day belongs to a singular president, such as George Washington or Abraham Lincoln whose birthdays are the basis for the holiday. On the other hand, referring to it as President's Day with the apostrophe after the S means it's the day that belongs to all presidents, that it's their day collectively. Finally, the day called President's Day is just plural with no apostrophe would indicate that we're honoring all POTUSes past and present, but no one president actually owns the day. President Nixon is frequently identified as the party responsible for changing Washington's birthday into President's Day and fostering the notion that it is a day for commemorating all U.S. presidents, a feat he supposedly achieved by issuing a proclamation on 21st of February 1971, declaring the third Monday in February to be a holiday set aside to honor all presidents, even myself. This claim stems from fact, however, and but was actually a newspaper spoof. Actually, presidential records indicate that Nixon merely issued an executive order on the 11th of February, defining the third Monday of February as a federal holiday, an announcement that executive order identified the day as Washington's birthday. So the official federal holiday on the third of February every year is really Washington's birthday. It isn't even President's Day of any spelling. <clears throat> so Washington was a very influential figure. He was a towering figure of uh, US history to the American public. In the <clears throat> honor of the man who commanded the Continental Army and led the American colonies to victory of the Revolutionary War, he served as the first president of the United States, earned the title of father of our country, Washington's birthday on February 22nd was celebrated with one is with as much patriotic fervor as any holiday, maybe except for the 4th of July. Accordingly, the observance of Washington's birthday was made official in 1885 by President Chester Allen Arthur, who signed a bill establishing it as a federal holiday. Washington, interestingly enough, was actually born on February 11th, 1732 under the Julian calendar, in effect at that time that he was born. But his birthday is reckoned or changed to February 22nd under the Gregorian calendar, which was adopted in 752. So a little background on these different calendars. The Julian calendar, as we probably know, was established by Julius Caesar um, way back thousands of years ago. And at that time, he calculated <clears throat> the length of a year to be 365.25 days, which meant you had three years and then you had a leap year. Uh, pope Gregory, who was a Catholic Pope in uh, 1582, 
developed his calendar in which he realized or recognized that there was actually 365.2425 days in a year. Now this doesn't seem like much of a difference, but in Washington's case, it made a difference of um, 11 days. Um, so that's why his birthday is now actually celebrated on February 22nd. <clears throat> Lincoln, although it's never been designated as a federal holiday, it was observed as a state holiday in many parts of the country. However, after federal additional federal holidays were created for Columbus Day and Martin Luther King Day, some states dropped the observance of Lincoln's birthday as a separate holiday in order to maintain a fixed number of paid holidays per year, while other states never observed Lincoln's birthday in the first place. As a result, we now have a hodgepodge of state holidays scheduled in the United States. Some states still observe Lincoln's and Washington's birthday as separate holidays. Some states observe only Washington's birthday. Some states commemorate both the single President's Day or Lincoln Washington Day. Some states celebrate neither. And there are odd exceptions such as Alabama, which designates the third Monday in February as a day to commemorate both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, even though Jefferson was born in April. A few states even moved their observance of Washington's birthday, Lincoln's birthday, and President's Day to November or December in order to lengthen the Thanksgiving and Christmas holiday periods without creating any additional paid holidays. Connecticut is one of the few states that still remembers Lincoln's birthday. However, most states, including my native Minnesota, do not celebrate it anymore. An interesting fact though, as we are here in February, is that the Black History Month has its origins in the 19th century celebrations of Lincoln's birthday by the African-American communities in the United States. By the early 20th century, Black communities were annually celebrating Lincoln's birthday in conjunction with the birthday of a former slave and abolitionist, Frederick, Frederick John Douglass on February 14th. So in February, when we celebrate President's Day, it appears that we can celebrate one, two, or all the presidents, and also find the best car deals of all time. So here's a, a little picture to show how all of the states in the United States celebrate uh, or don't celebrate the um, President's Day. So the ones that are in white don't celebrate at all. Some celebrate presidents with the apostrophe after the S, the other before the S. Some just celebrate Washington's birthday, Washington and Lincoln. But I think my favorite is uh, Arkansas, which on the third Monday in February celebrates George Washington's birthday and Daisy Gatson Bates Day, all on that day. Who in the world is Daisy Gatson Bates? So George Washington was the first president um, he was born on February 22nd, 1732, and served as the first president from 1789 to 1797. As the first president, he was well aware of his great responsibility of defining the American presidency. I walk an untrodden ground, he was often said to mention, as he made in the days leading up to his first inauguration. Washington believed that the precedents he set must make the presidency powerful enough to function effectively in the national government, but at the same time, these practices could not show any tendency towards monarchy or dictatorship. In, a, in addition to defining the actual powers of the office, Washington also needed to show the new nation how the leader of the democracy should behave socially. There was no precedent for this office in a world full of kings leaving Washington the monumental task of trying to figure out how to act like a president. He was elected by unanimous vote of the Electoral College, the only president in the US history to do so. His favor with the American people came due in part to his superb leadership as general of the Continental Army and his victory over General Cornwallis of England. Did Cornwallis really surrender to Washington? 
On October 19th, 1781, British General Cornwallis surrendered to George Washington at Yorktown in Virginia. The Allied army of 7,000 continental and even more French troops began bombarding Yorktown in mid-September and knocked out almost all the British guns by October 11th. Cornwallis knew reinforcements from New York for the British would not arrive in time and he reluctantly sent out a drummer with a white flag on October 17th. On the 19th, the official surrender ceremony was held. The American and French soldiers marched into town. The British soldiers marched between the two allies and laid down their arms. And the British drummers and fifers played a popular British song called The World Turned Upside Down as their troops surrendered. At the formal surrender ceremony, however, George Cornwallis refused to attend, feigning illness. He sent his second in command, General Charles O'Hara, to surrender his sword to George Washington and said. At the ceremony, O'Hara tried to give his sword to the French General Rochambeau, but he refused it and directed him to General Washington. As O'Hara was Cornwallis's second, Washington refused to honor this breach of protocol, and he directed O'Hara to surrender the sword to his own second in command, General Benjamin Lincoln. Short time following the surrender, Washington and Rochambeau entertained the British officers to dinner. The British officers were overwhelmed by the civility of their former foes and extended, had extended to them, with some French officers even offering profuse sympathies for the defeat. Equally, the French aide to Rochambeau noted that the coolness of the British officers, officers particularly O'Hara, considered the humiliation they had just endured. So it's an interesting way that war used to be fought where after the war was over, it's almost like a wrestling match or a boxing match where the uh, two opponents get together and they uh, have dinner together and talk about the war. Too bad things aren't that civil these days. There's a little screen of uh, Washington and Rochambeau planning the final siege at Yorktown. And the second picture shows the formal surrender with the British walking between the French and US uh, soldiers. But who was president until 1789? We know George Washington was elected in 1788, so who was president during the years in between? Actually, 14 men served as president of the First Continental Congress. And uh, after the war, the Congress of the Confederation, which is what it became after the ratification of our Articles of Confederation, the first constitution. The men who filled this role included some people that you may have heard of, Virginia's Peyton Randolph. If you've ever been to Williamsburg, his home is prominently featured there. And one of the most famous people, um, Massachusetts, John Hancock. Uh, but most of the others people don't even, um, would never recognize today. The president of Congress thus was by design a position with little authority. Continental Congress, fearful of concentrating political power in an individual, gave their presiding offer, officer even less responsibility than the speakers in the lower house of colonial assemblies. Beyond a similar similarity to the title, the office of president of the Congress bore no relationship to the later office of president of the United States. Presidents of Congress served terms in no specific duration. Their tenure ended when they either resigned or they lacking an official resignation when the Congress selected a successor. As an example, Henry Middleton served as president for four days, John Hancock served for almost three years. So Washington had a successful presidency. He established many of the norms that presidents in the future were expected to hold. And as his, the end of his second term approached, he considered his farewell address to the nation. In 1796, President Washington was 64 years old. He suffered from the ills of both physical and political pains. 
plagued by painful dentures, rheumatism, facing increased attacks from his opponents by, for his policies, the former Revolutionary War general decided he would not seek a third term in the nation's highest office. As he did so, he and his longtime friend and protege, Alexander Hamilton, drafted a farewell address in the 7,641 word document, the nation's first president called for the American people to remain unified, resist the rise of political factions and avoid the influence of foreign powers. Washington was not bound by a two year limit, but he, he, he felt if he died in office, he feared it would establish a precedent that the presidency was a lifetime appointment. Instead, he stepped aside to make way for a successor, proving to future generations and his contemporary critics, his commitment to democracy rather than power. Does anybody remember who George Washington's vice president was? Um, it was actually John Adams who became our second president. In those early years, the vice president was simply the guy who got the second most number of votes which was a system that uh, by the time John Adams ran for president, Thomas Jefferson was his vice president and they were from different political parties. And thus they didn't really agree on a lot of things. So by the time of the third presidential election, uh, running mates were actually established with very little power as vice president. Four years before Washington actually left office, he considered retiring after his first term. He asked James Madison to draft a farewell address. In the spring of 1797, Washington found Madison's draft, made up some additions of his own, turned it over to Hamilton, who ended up drafting his version. Washington and Hamilton worked closely on the address, which took the form of a public letter to the American people. It was published in the Daily American Advisor of Philadelphia newspaper on September 19th, 19, 1796, and later reprinted in papers throughout the country. The letter included three main principles, importance of unity, the worst enemy of the government, loyalty to party over nation, and the dangers of foreign entanglements. So I've just summarized Washington's farewell speech and it's very interesting because today, um, throughout the years, presidents, many have referred to Washington's farewell speech as sort of a prototype for the kind of speech that they want to lead as they depart office. So um, Washington felt staying together as a nation and importance of unity was of paramount importance. After opening with an explanation of his choice not to seek a third term, Washington's farewell address urged Americans not to put their regional and sectional interests above their interests as the nation as a whole. You have joined in a common cause, fought and triumphed together, Washington declared. The independence and liberty you possess are the work of joint councils, joint efforts, and common dangers, sufferings, and successes. Regions such as the North, South, East, and West should see their common interests rather than their differences, he continued. Your unity ought to be considered as a main prop of your liberty, and the love of the one ought to endear you to the preservation of the other. The second thing that Washington warned against was loyalty to party over nation. Uh, this is particularly interesting in the times we live today, I think, probably. According to Washington, one of the chief dangers of letting regional loyalties dominate loyalty to the nation as a whole is that, that it would lead to factionalism or the development of competing political parties. When Americans voted according to their party loyalty rather than the common interest of the nation, Washington feared it would foster a spirit of revenge and enabled the rising of cunning and, and ambitious and unprincipled men who would usurp for themselves the reins of government, destroying afterwards the very engines which had lifted them to unjust dominion. In fact, political parties had already begun to emerge and by the time Washington stepped aside. Federalists, who drew their support largely from New England, advocated for a strong national government 
and the fiscal programs created by Hamilton, the nation's first secretary of the treasury, Republicans, later Democratic Republicans, led by Southerners like Thomas Jefferson and Madison, opposed Hamilton's economic policies. They also split with the Federalists in foreign policies, favoring a closer relationship with France as opposed to Great Britain. Washington supported Hamilton's financial programs and sided with the Federalists in supporting the Jay Treaty with Britain. By the end of his presidency, Washington was weathering increasingly bitter attacks from his Republican critics and his farewell address represented his response to such attacks, as well as the more general statement of his principles. Third point was Washington was very concerned about foreign entanglements. Just as regionalism would lead to the formation of political parties, Washington believed partisanship would open the door to foreign influence and corruption. While he advocated for the United States to be one on good terms with all nations, especially commercial relations, he argued that inter-veteran antipathies against particular nations and passionate attachments to others should be excluded. Europe had its own very complicated set of interests and the United States should keep its distance from European affairs, Washington believed. Foreign policy based on neutrality was the safest way to maintain national unity and stability in the United States. Although Washington saw the need for the nation to be involved in itself in foreign affairs, in the case of war or other emergency, he argued that it must steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. Very interesting, even 200 years ago. Washington's legacy in his farewell address was rooted in the specific challenges he saw in the United States at the time, including increasingly internal divisions and ongoing external threat of invasion by stronger nations. But his eloquent message of unity and his warnings against regionalism, partisanship and foreign influence ensured that the address would be one of the most widely reprinted documents in American history with powerful implications that continue to resonate even today. Washington's monumentous decision to step aside after two terms set a precedent that would be followed by every succeeding president except Franklin Roosevelt, who would be, which would then formalize the 22nd Amendment to the United States in 1951, which limited the presidential uh, office to two terms. In addition to dating back to the years following the Civil War, a member of the United States Senate read farewells, Washington's farewell address allowed each year to observe Washington's birthday. The reading assignment alternates between the members of each political party. So that is um, maybe some information about um, Washington and President's Day that you may not have been aware of. I also have a little um, fun quiz here that I thought we would um, do just for the fun of it. And it's called 10 Common Misconceptions About George Washington. Some of the most commonly known facts, quote unquote, about George Washington simply are not true. Go beyond the mythology and find out how much you really know or don't know about the man. So probably the most popular story is the cherry tree. Um, how young George Washington demonstrated his honest character after coming clean about chopping down his father's cherry tree. Is that true or isn't it? It's false. Ironically, this iconic story about the value of honesty was invented by one of George Washington's first biographers, an itinerant minister and a bookseller named Mason Locke Weems. His cherry tree myth is the most well-known and longest enduring legend about George Washington. In the original story, when Washington was just six years old, he received a hatchet as a gift and damaged his father's cherry tree. When his father discovered what had been done, he became angry and confronted him. George bravely said, I cannot tell a lie. I did cut it down with my hatchet. 
Washington's father embraced him, rejoiced in his son's honesty, and he was worth more than a thousand trees. Over the years, we've all heard this story, and uh, whether it's true or not, it was just a great lesson for our young people to understand the importance of honesty. So probably a good little story, even if it's not true. George Washington's teeth were made out of wood. Is that true? What do you all think? Yeah. <laughs> False. One of the most enduring myths about Washington is that his dentures were made of wood. It's quite possible that some of his dentures, particularly after they had been stained, took on a woody complexion, but wood was never used in the construction of any dental fittings. Throughout his life, Washington employed numerous full and partial dentures, which were constructed of materials including human and probably cow and horse teeth, ivory, possibly, lead tin alloy, copper alloy, poss possibly brass and silver alloy. The teeth pictured here are actually, I believe in the Smithsonian um, History Museum. And these are actual uh, dentures that Washington wore, amazingly. George Washington wore a white wig because it was popular in his time. Is that true? False. Even though wigs were fashionable, George Washington kept his own hair. He kept his hair long and tied it back in a queue or a ponytail. Although he didn't wear a wig, George Washington did powder his hair, giving it the iconic white color seen in famous portraits. Powdering one's hair was another custom of the time. As a young man, Washington actually was a redhead. How many of you knew that? Did he really skip a coin across the Potomac River? Well, false. The Potomac River is over a mile wide at Mount Vernon, and even George Washington did not, did not have an arm to fling a silver dollar that far. Moreover, there were no silver dollars when Washington was a young man. First silver dollar coin was minted in 1794. His stepson, George Washington Parker Davis, recounts the story in which the general hurls a piece of slate across the Rappahannock River in Fredericksburg. This would have been more plausible and more likely where the story began. This myth is frequently told to demonstrate George Washington's considerable physical strength, but not true. George Washington was the first man to live in the White House, the first president to live in the White House. Is that true? No. Nope. When Washington was inaugurated as the first president, the White House had not been built. In fact, Washington, D.C. was not even the nation's capital. The first president lived in the White House was Washington's successor, George John Adams. At the beginning of his presidency, George Washington and his first family resided in the Samuel Osgood House in New York City, located uptown facing the East River. It was just a few blocks away from the countryside. Although it was the best available residence in New York at the time of the Washington inauguration, its location proved inconvenient, size too small for the president's household. He was relocated to another residence on Lower Broadway in 1790 and then later to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Although he never lived in Washington, D.C. or the White House, George Washington did help build the Capitol. In July of 1790, Congress passed the Residence Act, which called for the permanent capital of the United States to be located on the Potomac River. When President George Washington signed the bill, he took personal control over the building of what he once termed the seat of the empire. He specified the location of the 10 mile square federal district and the president's mansion, which we call the White House and the Capitol. George Washington is buried in a crypt beneath the U.S. Capitol. Well, for all of you who have seen the Nicolas Cage movie, um, you probably think there may be some truth to this, but no, it's false. In his will, Washington outlined his desire to be buried at home at Mount Vernon along with his wife and the rest of the Washington family. 
His final resting place is in a tomb overlooking the Potomac in his beloved estate. However, the crypt at the United States Capitol building is one time intended to be the burial place for the first president, but he's not in there. One question a lot of people ask is why isn't George Washington buried at the Capitol? Well, George Washington's gravesite is at his home on Vernon. Other people have tried to bury him elsewhere and were not successful. George Washington was famous for his many victories on the battlefield. Okay, could this one be true? False. George Washington was rarely victorious in battle. In fact, he lost more battles than he won. Washington was appointed commander of the Continental Army in 1775, despite having little practical experience in managing large conventional armies. Washington proved to be a capable and resilient leader of the American military forces during the war, and his leadership, presence, and fortitude held the American military together long enough to secure victory at Yorktown. While he lost more battles than he won, Washington employed a winning strategy that included important victories at Trenton and Yorktown. Perhaps Washington's greatest wartime legacy was his decision to surrender his commission to Congress, affirming the principle of civilian control of the military in these new United States. George Washington was a Republican. Nope. President Washington was not affiliated with any political party. In fact, he was totally against the notion of partisanship and warned against it in his farewell address. Political parties may now and then answer popular ends. They are likely in the course of time and things to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power as we read earlier. So he was not a part of any political party. George Washington grew hemp at Mount Vernon is that possibly true? Well, it sort of is. George Washington did grow hemp at Mount Vernon, but not the kind you're thinking of. Throughout his lifetime, Washington cultivated hemp at Mount Vernon for industrial uses. The fibers from hemp hold excellent properties for making rope and sail canvas, thread for clothing, and used for repairing the large fishing nets used in his fishing operations on the Potomac. At one point in the 1760s, Washington considered whether hemp would be more lucrative than tobacco, and he actually ultimately ended up thinking wheat was the best alternative. In our last question, George and Martha Washington had several children together. Unfortunately, Washington was fond of children, but he and Martha did not have any children of their own. Many have speculated as to why Martha and George could not have children, but it's impossible to know why they were childless, despite the fact they were, they were always children in Washington's household and throughout their marriage. Martha Washington brought two children, John Park Curtis and Martha Park Curtis into their marriage from previous, her previous marriage. Together they raised Mrs. Washington's children as well as two of their four grandchildren and several nieces at Mount Vernon. So that is my presentation for today. I thank you for joining. Holly, if you're there, I'm happy to answer any questions. If I would happen to know the answers, I'd be happy to share them. Ken, thank you really for all that Th those are fun facts. I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed hearing hearing all that you had to say. And thank you for taking the time to dig through, and uh, and find out all that information. Who knew he was a redhead? I mean, I didn't know that, and and uh, I was sort of surprised to hear that. But um, and that he didn't wear all those wigs we keep thinking about. He just powdered his hair with that white powder, as was the custom at the time. And and maybe Ken, do you know if were they powdering them because it was a fashion statement or were they powdering them to keep the bugs away? I thought I heard something about that once. Do you there know? Are, I've heard both as well. But uh, today, if you watch any of these English TV shows, the lawyers and the judge all put on these silly little gray wigs that uh, even today, hundreds of years later, it's still a custom in England. So. Uh, 
It may have been that that white look of the wig was what made it fashionable to powder your hair. Um, that's just my guess. I think Williamsburg talks about that a lot. <laughs> I think Holly or yeah. Ken. Yeah, good morning. Um, my understanding about the wigs as well is they were often infested with lice. Yeah, the wigs. Oh, the wigs were. <laughs> were often, there was uh -huh. an issue with bugs um, and also that while sometimes they use talc or powder, sometimes it for people who were less well off, they even use flour. So when they were powdering their hair mm. or powdering their so the whole thing was, was <laughs> gross. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it was pretty gross. <laughs> that's Thank a, you. that's amazing. Thanks for that. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, yeah, I was I was surprised by that one. Um, does anybody else have any other questions of Ken while we have him here? He's just a wealth I, I of do. information. I do. Oh, he, okay. Hey, Harry. <laughs> First of all, Ken, thank you very much. It was excellent. Oh, thank very, you. Very. Uh, yeah, I very, enjoyed very it. Very informative. Very interesting. Yeah, it was very good. Um, do you know anything about what livestock? Uh, this is the veterinarian and me mm -hmm. coming out, even though I'm a has-been. Do, do you know anything about what livestock uh, Washington kept at Mount Vernon? I think traditionally you raised your own food source. So I would guess if you had milk, you needed at least a milk cow. Uh, if you served beef, you must had something that you regularly could butcher for your own beef as well as pork. My guess is he had everything. That would just be my guess. I don't think they specialized um, in those days. I, I meant more from a perspective of commercial for sale. For example, on our property here in North Granby, yeah. we know through Mark Williams work that right from the beginning, uh, the Cossets raised oxen, not just for their own use, but for sale Okay. and, and, and for meat. I was just curious because you touched on the, the hemp production and the wheat production and so on. I was just curious if this farm in Mount Vernon was a commercial supplier of... So oxen, I suppose, would be more like horses where they had a utility uh, right. value. Right. Well, Right, but and would also so could see oxen could be commercial. Uh -huh. um, I just Googled so, Mount Vernon. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, me it too. said that, that he had 600 to 1,000 sheep. Oh, wow. And I know from reading Outlander that he was a famous horseman. Yeah. So um, he raced horses and he had horses on the farm and then the usual farm animals, you know, hogs yeah. and whatever, cattle and that sort of thing. Thank but he, you, was, he was known, I, I just from my history reading, I know he was known as a famous horseman of the time mm -hmm. in Virginia, yeah. yeah. And, okay. and Ken, it also um, indicates that at Mount Vernon, um, even today, the breeds that are still there, which reflect the oh. breeds that they had back in the day were um, Asaba Island Hogs, O-S-S-A-B-A-W. <laughs> Um, so I don't know what an Asaba Island hog is, but that's what they had. And then Hog Island sheep. So uh, Dominique chickens and Red Devon cattle. Um, yeah. So so Harry, uh, at, Harry Sturbridge had Village, a job, yeah. <laughs> at Sturbridge Village, they actually did what they call backbreeding, where they actually tried to create animals that would have been reflective of the 1830s heritage breed and and some of the practices which didn't include cutting the horns off of the cattle so at Sturbridge village the uh, the cattle are you know have the horns but it was just because the practice i believe is that what you understand was not to take the horns off of the uh, the cattle that that's correct, and and especially working oxen, where mm -hmm. the the horns, of course, are very stout and well attached, and they were a point of 
restraint if one chooses to use it. For example, a rope around the base of the horn. Oh, okay. And okay. for the most part, oxen don't assault each other with mm -hmm. their horns. Um, bulls and cows do, but mm -hmm. oxen don't tend to. And we had uh, years ago, we, we would have our, I would go up on the hill here and mark so-called fuel log trees, trees to be cut down for firewood. And uh, a, a friend of mine from Suffield would come with his Red Devon oxen. Oh, okay. Com complete with horns and uh, go up on the hill instead of a motorized skitter, he'd go up on the hill with a pair of Red Devons and fell the trees and limb them and drag them down where I could take over. Mm -hmm. hmm. I'm sure that's how they got the maple sap out of the wood. Cor correct. Tree, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Harry, I just saw on Google that he's known as the father of the American mule. Washington. Washington, because wow. he was given a stud by Spain and he um, a uh, stud from, oh no, from the King of Spain and Lafayette sent another. And the bottom line is he started breeding mules. So he's known as the father of the American mule. Wow. That's kind of cool. Really? He's an interesting man. Yeah. I'll share with you and then I'll shut up. I'll share with you the definition of a mule. And that is 900 pounds of free enterprise with no hope of posterity nor pride of parentage. <laughs> anyway, that's it. That's a good definition. Yeah. Ken, um, again, Ken, this was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, special thank you to Ken for taking the time to do the research and put this together and learn a, learn a whole new technology um, to, to kind of give us the information that kind of makes our kicks off our weekend on a nice start. Um, it's President's Day weekend, so I hope everyone has... Um... How are you spelling that? <laughs> you had to ask, huh? Apostrophe S. It's Washington's birthday. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's a vote right there. Okay. Um, but anyhow, I'm really glad that you folks took time out of your day um, to join us. And uh, Ken, I'm really grateful that you and the friends who are supporting this program today. Please don't hesitate to look to the library's online calendar of events for more virtual programming coming up in March. We have a lot. We have a lot happening. There's always a lot happening. Um, it, it, even for the rest of this month of February, um, there's a um, co-sponsored program with birdscaping, um, inviting native plants into your yard. That's later uh, February 24th. Um, we also have some journaling programs going on that are um, the folks that are attending are really happy with those. Um, and for the teens, there's been some cooking classes coming up as well as, um, Oh, gosh. Um, oh, what else was I going to tell you about? Oh, Can I just say I want to thank Holly for her efforts. You're actually in the in the town library, right? I, I'm, I'm actually in the town library. To, I'm oh. here a lot, actually. I yeah. should probably get a cot. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm here today. But, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's a it's a love so i love what i do and you folks make it all worthwhile we appreciate it. We if, appreciate if anybody it. has additional suggestions for programs that they'd like to see we'd, we'd love to have you here um the one other series that we have kicking off um this month which starts thursday the 18th is called let's talk and it's a guide to conversation in challenging times and it's a four-part series being facilitated by Linda Darcy. She's an equity trainer and she's also a former GMHS graduate from way back in the day. Her parents are still in town and Linda's going to come back to us virtually to guide us through what I think is going to be a very interesting uh, four program series. It's on Thursday nights. Mm -hmm. Um, if you can join us, we'd love to see you. The first one is about engaging in productive conversations in challenging times. We're also going to examine and delve into social identity, uh, culture, and then the words that we use. And so um, the whole premise of this series was that um, Granby's a really uh, great community, and we want to be able to have 
those difficult conversations that maybe are sometimes awkward or challenging with our friends, our family, and our neighbors, and uh, still, you know, keep the blood pressure down. <laughs> so um, we're hoping that folks will uh, will will join us for that particular program. But again, thank you all for coming today. And uh, Can I just say one other thing: absolutely. these presentations are in Google Slides. So anybody that would like a copy, uh, they can just contact you or me, and uh, I'd be happy to share those. And if they don't want to have to bother Ken, Ken, we're happy to have you call them direct, but you'll be able to view this particular recording on the Granby Public Library YouTube channel. Not all of our recordings um, or programs make it there for various reasons, but this one in particular will be there and uh, it should be there within 48, 72 hours max. So you'll be mm -hmm. able to watch it again and uh, review the information, but um, it's all good. And um, I'm Glad, glad to see you all today, and I look forward to seeing you again. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Holly. Thank You're you. welcome. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Thanks you all, guys. So good. Thank you all.